it gives us great pleasure on behalf of news platform to invite uh, Mr. Prashant Bhushan to a discussion on the collapse of India's democracy. Now, I must say that uh, Mr. Prashant Bhushan is very well known, but uh, you might see have seen my face for the first time on news platform. So who am I? Uh, my name is Rahul Mukherjee. I am a professor of political science at the South Asia Institute at Heidelberg University. This is a very unique institute. It has departments ranging from modern and classical languages to history, anthropology, development economics, and geography, all dedicated to the study of South Asia. Heidelberg is the oldest German university, and it is not only famous for producing Western thinkers like Hegel and Max Weber, but it has a deep and venerable tradition in Indological studies. In fact, uh, not very long ago, during the war and before the war, a person called Heinrich Zimmer was held the chair of Indology at Heidelberg. More recently, Harman Kulka, who did work on early medieval India, was awarded the Padma Shri. And eight Indian languages, including Sanskrit, Pali, Urdu, uh, Hindi, Tamil, Bangla, Nepali, are taught in this institute. So we combine modernity with tradition, and we have a deep interest in learning from South Asia. Prashantji, as you know, really needs no introduction. But I want to tell you a few things about why we think he is so important for this discussion. The first reason for me is that he upholds the Indian constitution without paying allegiance, I think, to any political party. For him, the constitution of India and defending the idea of India as he thinks it proper is more important than allegiance to any single party in India. So it is his allegiance to the idea of India, which reminds me of the likes of Mohandas Gandhi and Jai Prakash Narayan, among many others, that inspires me to have this conversation with him. And in keeping with that inspiration, Prashantji, my first question to you is, how would you compare threat to the Indian constitution at the time of the national emergency with the present moment? And what do you think were the challenges at that time? And how do those challenges compare with the present moment in Indian politics and history? Uh, though the emergency is regarded as the sort of darkest period for Indian democracy, but in my view, in many ways, the present period is even darker than that. During the emergency, there were two major problems. One was uh, virtual abolition of uh, uh, liberty, where uh, anybody could be put in prison under the draconian MISA, Maintenance of Internal Security Act, a preventive detention law. And unfortunately, the Supreme Court had ruled that uh, there is no writ of habeas corpus during the emergency because fundamental rights had been suspended. The second uh, major uh, attack on democracy was uh, press censorship and therefore the in inability of the press or the media to speak out openly and say anything against uh, the dispensation at that time. What we are seeing today <laughs> is uh, not uh, such a sort of, there is no uh, emergency, but there is a very strong attack on personal liberty 
uh, <clears throat> partly by way of using uh, another uh, draconian law like called the National Security Act, which is also a preventive detention law, partly on account of using another draconian law called the uh, UAPA, Unlawful Activities Prevention Act, under which if you charge somebody, it is virtually <coughs> impossible to get bail. And partly because you have let loose lynch mobs on the streets with a complicit police, which is allowing these lynch mobs a free run. Uh, if they are lynching those people who belong to minority communities or those who are raising their voice against the government. The, uh, all the enforcement agencies, that is the police, the CBI, the ED, the income tax department, the NIA, uh, uh, the, the CBI, all of them have been supported for political purposes as target and victimize people who uh, uh, either go against the government or belong to the minority communities. Now, this is a very, very serious uh, problem, which is uh, the number of people who have been put in prison are not comparable to those who were in prison during the emergency. But anybody and everybody is uh, fair game for this regime, and they are also under threat. Secondly, though press censorship has not been imposed uh, yet, there is a very insidious kind of press censorship by way of targeting and victimizing independent media organizations by charging them with sedition, people like Siddharth Vardarajan, Vinod Dua, etc. <coughs> by uh, letting loose the <coughs> enforcement agencies against them, such as against NDTV. And even worse, there is a whole scale, large scale compromising of the mainstream media by way of virtually buying them out or coercing and threatening them or intimidating them into submission so that large section of, uh, sections of the mainstream media have fallen in line and are just doing exactly what the government wants them to do. That is to spread communal hatred that is to raise diversionary issues so as to distract the people's attention from real issues. But there are, there is a more serious problem today than there was during the emergency. There is an attack on all our institutions, so all the independent regulatory institutions created by the constitution or the laws. So there is an attack on the judiciary, on its independence, so, so that the Supreme Court has virtually crumbled against this kind of onslaught uh, from the government. There is an attack on the Election Commission by way of uh, uh, appointing people uh, who are uh, subservient to them, who are uh, somehow compromised, who can be, uh, who can be uh, blackmailed into submission. For example, that Sunil Arora, he, there, there was the famous Radia tape. He was uh, in that Radia tape in which he was heard talking to Neera Radia about uh, some friend of his having procured a judgment from the Chief Justice of the Punjab and Haryana High Court by paying him nine crores. And then anybody who stands up like one of the recent election commissioners, they are harassed by income tax and other enforcement agencies so as to force them to quit. He has been forced to quit and go to the Asian Development Bank. The result is that you have an election commission which is now fixing election dates at the bidding of the ruling party, where election dates are really announced by the ruling party and not by the election commission. You have an election commission which is not enforcing the model code of conduct against uh, the uh, prime minister or the leader of the Bharti Janta Party and their leaders, etc. There is an attack on the controller and auditor general with the result that uh, for the first time in 70 years, we have seen the CAG delete 
the pricing details from the Rafael contract, something which has never happened before at the instance of the government. We have seen for the first time the CAG delete or not do an audit of the Rafael offset contract after saying that they would do it. That has been knocked out at the instance of the government. We are seeing an attack on the NHRC by way of the sea. When you appoint compromised people to these institutions, you can easily blackmail them into submission. And even if they are protected independent institutions, even then they do the government's bidding. The NHRC has, has been reduced to a useless institution. <clears throat> same thing about the Lokpal, same thing about the CVC, and of course, all these enforcement and investigative agencies are completely at their bidding. But even more insidious than that is the assault today on, <clears throat> on, on free speech, on uh, scientific temper, on critical thinking itself, and on culture by way of spreading a culture of hate, fake news, abuse, filthiest abuses are hurled against people on the social media by the BJP's IT cell, which is controlled by the prime minister himself, against any person who dares to criticize the prime minister or the <coughs> uh, 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 ruling party. So, this was not there during the emergency. This culture of absolute gutter filth in terms of language, in terms of lynch mobs being let loose on the streets, there is an assault on the rule of law. There is an assault on scientific temper. The prime minister himself goes to inaugurate the Ambani hospital and says that uh, Lord Ganesha's trunk was stitched by plastic surgery. He tells children of schools that there is no such thing as climate change and people, when they grow old, they start feeling older. And all kinds of his ministers are saying that some papad will cure corona or go corona, go will cure corona. There is an attack on critical thinking itself. Universities are supposed to be places which promote critical thinking. But today, there is a whole scale attack launched on universities. There is no scale, uh, space being given for any kind of free discussions inside universities. There are, you are appointing RSS vice chancellors who know nothing about education, but who are saying that now we will keep a tank, uh, we will keep tanks in these campuses in order to instill a sense of discipline among the students. So, <clears throat> uh, we have never faced this whole scale attack on scientific temper, on critical thinking, on our culture, on civilization itself, on all our institutions of democracy. I mean, today's situation is in uh, virtually every way far worse than what was uh, there during the emergency. The only thing during the emergency which was perhaps worse was the attack on individual liberty, because uh, a lot more people were put behind bars and uh, an, an atmosphere of fear prevailed during that time. Uh, that kind of fear is also there today, but not perhaps as much as was during the emergency. Fortunately, one good thing that has happened is the growth of the social media and the internet media, which is uh, social media is good and bad, is also used to spread hate and uh, fake news, but it can also be used because it, social media can't be controlled by money. And mm -hmm. there it can also be used to spread a lot of uh, good information uh, and uh, the right kind of views about what is happening in, in society today. Mm -hmm. uh, the second thing is, uh, um, yeah, so, so, so that, uh, to some extent, uh, kind of compensates for the uh, capture of the mainstream media or the assault on the, uh, on the media by the government today. So in, in these two respects, the situation today is slightly better. Liberty and maybe press censorship, slightly better than 
what it was during the emergency mm -hmm. but in mm -hmm. many respects it is much worse mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. no that is uh, really really worrisome and i think uh, the other aspect of it being much worse is that we are told that we are living under normal times so uh, you know it's it's easier for people to believe that we are living under normal times and and actually the situation is becoming much worse because when the national emergency was imposed uh, i remember mrs indira gandhi was not allowed to deliver a lecture at the jawaharlal nehru university i was uh, growing up as uh, a young boy uh, of a father who used to teach in that university and and that was the extent to which mrs gandhi would respect uh, the opposition that had arisen to her leadership at that time uh, now now you have actually talked a lot about the supreme court and the manner in which it has been compromised and you've actually kind of fought a battle on that so so people know this story very well but uh, i was just wondering whether you want to say some things that are not very well known about the manner in which the supreme court is compromised especially the manner in which uh, judge loya was handled and what kind of resistance is there from within the supreme court and from within the high courts uh, so that uh, ultimately the supreme court can also give a kind of decision which uh, which makes which certainly tells the world that you have been punished but uh, but only to the extent that you need to pay a rupee so i i i i would like you to reflect in a slightly more nuanced way about the challenges certainly that you have mentioned and those can be reiterated but what are the possibilities within the system of uh, resisting these challenges within the supreme court and the high courts so uh... the main thing that has happened the more worrying thing that has happened recently is that we have seen that the supreme court appears to have surrendered its independence from the government and they are just willing to do whatever the government wants them to do on all politically sensitive and important cases that's the uh, very worrying thing and that was what i had said in my tweet when i said that when historians look back Uh, and see how democracy has been destroyed in the last six years. They will note the role of the Supreme Court in this destruction, and particularly its last four chief justices. Now, <clears throat> you see, this uh, surrender of independence, so to say, has happened uh, partly because we have a very strong government at the center, and this also happened during the emergency. during the emergency while many high courts resisted and held that uh, habeas corpus writ was maintainable even during the emergency the supreme court reversed their decisions today also we are seeing something similar many high courts are giving good decisions by way of uh, telling the government that your propaganda against the tablighi jamaat was totally malafide and communal by telling the government that the imprison uh, putting dr kafil khan under nsa was malafide <clears throat> etc but unfortunately we have seen that by and large the supreme court has done the bidding of the government whether it is the whether you take uh, the non hearing of important cases challenging the citizenship amendment act challenging the abolition of article 317 kashmir <coughs> non hearing of habeas corpus petitions or even in hearing and deciding non hearing of electoral bonds hearing and deciding uh, the ayodhya case in the manner in which the supreme court did by handing over that land to the very people who it had held had destroyed a mosque by way of a criminal conspiracy whether it's handling of the rafael case where they said that no investigation is required because the government gave them some cock and bull story in a sealed cover which was not mm -hmm. even true to the other side 
and which turned out to be cock and bull, uh, which was reproduced in the judgment that a CAG report has been given and it is made public and so on. It turned out to be complete cock and bull. So they swallowed the cock and bull story which was given to them in a sealed cover in an unsigned note. I mean, this is a new kind of jurisprudence which the Supreme Court has adopted, that is of accepting information from the government in uh, by way of unsigned notes in a sealed cover, which are not even shown to the other side and then relying upon that. It's unheard of. It's making a mockery of uh, the justice system. And this is being done again and again. It was done in the CBI director case. It was done in the Loya case. The Loya case, again, the Supreme Court held that there was no need for investigation because the government had given them something in a sealed cover which satisfied them that uh, there is no need for investigation. That sealed cover was not even shown to the other parties. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Same thing happened in the Birla Sahara case. I mean, firstly, the matter is dealt with by a judge who is not only a professed admirer of Mr. Modi, who says in a public forum that he is a great genius and so on, but who invites all the BJP leaders to his nephew's wedding, including Shivraj Singh, who is said to have received 10 crores from the Sahara companies in that same diary, which was, which needed to be investigated. That same judge hears the matter without disclosing his conflict of interest and says that big people Powerful people cannot be investigated on the basis of newspapers. I mean, documents that were recovered by the income tax department from the Birla and the Sahara group of companies, which have been verified to be authentic and correct by the income tax department. And he says that mm -hmm. you know, these are loose papers on, on the basis of which big people can't be investigated. So we have mm -hmm. seen uh, the Supreme Court kind of, of course, there have been cases in which uh, the interests of the chief justices themselves were involved, where the chief justices sat in their own cause. Justice mm -hmm. Gogoi sat in his own sexual harassment case and thereafter handed it over to Arun Mishra. Mm -hmm. Same thing, uh, Justice Arun uh, Deepak Mishra sat in his own medical college uh, scam uh, uh, bribery case uh, and thereafter handed it over again to Mr. Arun, uh, Justice Arun Mishra. So now one reason, of course, why the Supreme Court, in my view, has surrendered its independence is because there is a very strong, almost fascist government in power today. And this does happen when there is a strong, almost fascist government in power. But another reason is that this government has been using all these investigative agencies to uh, suppress and suborn opposition leaders, media organizations, even business houses, and now probably the courts themselves or the judges themselves. And mm -hmm. this, and you see, the, the, mm -hmm. Justice A.P. Shah has recently written a very good article in the Hindu on how the master of mm -hmm. roster system, where the chief justice as master of roster can mm -hmm. assign every case to whichever bench he likes, and therefore, all politically, mm -hmm. if, if the government has the chief justice under their control, then all politically sensitive cases mm -hmm. can be assigned to convenient benches to be decided in the way the government wants them to be decided. This was the issue which was raised by four judges in that mm -hmm. press conference also. So uh, this is also mm -hmm. another way in which their independence seems to have been compromised. So that's mm -hmm. a more serious problem. Of course, corruption is there, has always been there in the mm -hmm. judiciary. There's nothing new in that. Mm -hmm. But what is new is the surrender of independence that we are seeing during the last six mm -hmm. years in mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So basically, uh, you are actually seeing that this is a real contrast to the history of the judiciary, even in relation to UPA and perhaps comparable to the national emergency. This is how you would. Yes, yes. Then you have already, uh, would you like to say a couple of things about the higher, higher courts and how they are able to still perform uh, under these there circumstances? Are, there are many high courts, there are many judges in those high courts and they can, uh, so uh, uh, some judges, 
turn out to be independent. Some chief justices turn out to be independent. They are made of sterner stuff, so to say. And therefore, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they uh, do not uh, succumb uh, to the pressures of the government. And that's why the High Court, that's what happened during the emergency. Mm -hmm. <coughs> a lot mm -hmm. depends upon the chief justice of a court. A lot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now you've already sort of covered the issue of a number of variety of institutions getting compromised and you mentioned the election commission already. But I would like you to throw some light on the election commission with respect to the electoral bonds issue and uh, what kinds of electoral reforms can need to be done in the light of this new development. You see, <clears throat> Uh, one of the problems in our uh, representative democracy is that we have first passed the post at two levels. When we vote for our representative, the one who gets the highest votes becomes the sole representative of that constituency, even if all the other candidates together have received four times as many votes. Secondly, when the government is formed, the party or the coalition which has a majority mm -hmm. gets the whole government and the rest of the opposition count for nothing in the government. Therefore, when people vote, they don't necessarily vote for the candidate or the party that they consider to be the best, because they know if they know, or if they feel that the best candidate or party has no chance of being elected. So they then uh, see which are the parties or candidates who have some chance of being elected. Mm -hmm. And then they choose the least bad amongst those, in their view, the least mm -hmm. bad among those. Now, how do they assess mm -hmm. which party or candidate has some chance? That assessment mm -hmm. is largely made on the visibility of that candidate or the party. And the visibility is largely purchased mm -hmm. by money. With money, you can buy advertisements, put up hoardings, mm -hmm. you have paid uh, workers who go around carrying your poster, distributing handbills, and with money you can also organize large election rallies. Mm -hmm. So, because these days people are purchased mm -hmm. bought to these election rallies. And if you have the media in your control, mm -hmm. then of course you can increase your visibility. Mm -hmm. So in this system, the parties mm -hmm. or candidates it's with money or those parties which are in government and especially the present government which ruthlessly misuses agencies and thereby controls the media, they enjoy a huge advantage. So <clears throat> mm -hmm. uh, now in order to reduce the role of money power, we did impose a limit by law on the expenses of candidates but we have not imposed mm -hmm. a limit mm -hmm. on expenses of parties. It is said in mm -hmm. the, that in the last election, the BJP spent 50,000 crores, which means mm -hmm. something like 100 crores per constituency, which is more than 100 times mm -hmm. the limit of mm -hmm. individual mm -hmm. candidates. So, <clears throat> so therefore, mm -hmm. uh, it makes a mockery of the limit on election expenses by not having a limit on expenses by political parties. Secondly, monetization was introduced. The prime minister said that he wanted a cashless economy. One can understand that uh, ordinary people can't be made cashless, but at least political parties and candidates could have been made cashless by making a law that all income and expenditure of candidates and parties would have to be through the banking channels. That was not done. Instead of that, uh, three very retrograde changes have been made in election, in uh, political funding laws. First is that the Foreign Contribution Regulation Act was amended to allow foreign uh, subsidiaries of foreign companies to fund political parties. So the whole object of FCK was to prevent foreign influence over political parties and public servants. That has been reversed by way of this amendment. Then they removed the limit on corporate 
uh, donations to political parties earlier, no company could donate more than 7.5% of their annual profits to political parties. That limit mm -hmm. has been totally removed. And lastly, and most insidious is the introduction of electoral bonds, by which these are bearer bonds which anybody can purchase from designated banks, from the state bank. So they are in denominations of 1 crore or 10 lakhs or 1 lakh, etc. Uh, or, or perhaps 10 crores also. So people can go and purchase them. Nobody's name is written on those bonds and they can give these bonds to political mm -hmm. parties. With the result that nobody comes to know, not even the election commission comes to know who has donated these bonds to these political parties. You have paved the way for bribes being given to political mm -hmm. parties through electoral bonds. I'm quite sure that a lot mm -hmm. of the electoral bonds which have, that is why more than 90% of the bonds have been received by the BJP, by the ruling party. Mm -hmm. Because most of these would be constituting bribes given by companies who have received contracts from the government. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So now, for example, uh, Dassault's Indian subsidiary can give donations to uh, the BJP uh, through electoral bonds and nobody will come to know that a bribe has been paid for the Rafale contract. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is, these are all very retrograde changes that have been made. What we need mm -hmm. are firstly uh, reforms by way of allowing uh, uh, proportional representation. This will reduce the impact of this first mm -hmm. part force. So if mm -hmm. a party gets 2% vote, they get 2% of their MPs or MLAs. So mm -hmm. therefore people won't feel that they are wasting their vote by voting for their favorite candidate or the party. Favorite. Mm -hmm. uh, today they feel that they would be wasting their vote and mm -hmm. therefore they have to choose the least evil among those who have lot of visibility and a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So that's one change that needs to be made. Other than that, you have to reduce the role of money in elections. Thirdly, you have to have some form of direct democracy also, mm -hmm. not just representative democracy. You should have mm -hmm. some system of initiatives and referendums on at least some important mm -hmm. issues. And you need to decentralize mm -hmm. power because the at the local level, at the panchayat level, uh, there can be uh, much better elections which are less influenced by money power. So therefore, mm -hmm. the more power you decentralize, uh, the better mm -hmm. will be your democracy. Mm -hmm. Now, those are actually very, very important points. So the first thing is that the first pass the post system has produced, uh, you know, puzzling problems that we were not thinking of seriously in the past. The second issue which has been debated ad nauseum is the issue of election funding, but that has actually become aggravated because we now can get money from foreign contributions. There is no limit on companies. And then who knows who has the electoral bond. So basically you are actually arguing that there needs to be a very critical look at the way in which our institutions of democracy have been fashioned for their longer sustenance of democracy. I think this is an extremely important point. So it's not just about winning the next elections. It is also about how you do your elections. Now, uh, in relation to a variety of things that you have said, I would now, because you've already mentioned the CAG, we could go into it. I think briefly, if there is something that you want to mention about the media beyond your initial comments, uh, we would like to hear a little bit about that. And then we would like to focus a little bit on what should be the response. So if you wish, uh, you could spend a couple of minutes uh, telling us some of the real challenges that make the media appear a little bit different from what it has ever looked like or resembles uh, what it was during the emergency. No, the media is today very different from what it was during the emergency. During the emergency, there was certainly press censorship, so you couldn't write anything against the government. 
but uh, we didn't see a media which was being used to spread hatred, which is being used to spread fake news so as to bludgeon the ability of people to distinguish between truth and falsehood. Bludgeon the ability of the people to distinguish between what are real important issues facing the country from what are totally trivial issues like this death of Sushant Singh Rajput, <laughs> which has been playing out on prime time for the last almost three months of mm. many channels. I mean, mm. today we are seeing absolutely something totally bizarre being done by the uh, mainstream media, particularly the electronic media, where prime time debates are just shouting matches on completely irrelevant issues and trying to promote uh, communal hatred and use of absolutely vile, filthy language, etc. I mean, it's an assault on every uh, basic sense of decency and civilization. It's totally nauseating. I don't know how these anchors and these uh, media persons who are doing this stuff mm. day in and day out, how they live, how they, how they survive with their conscience or any kind of uh, decency, how, uh, how they face uh, the people at home. But unfortunately, what it is doing is, it is clearly and definitely bludgeoning and eroding the capacity of people to think critically, to distinguish between truth and falsehood, as people say that we are creating by this media what is called a post-truth society, uh, where there is no distinction between truth and falsehood and everything is a question of perception. You can just create any kind of perception, like Mr. Modi says, no, no, there was no Chinese incursion. No, everything is fine. There is no COVID in this country. I have managed COVID. GDP is not falling. In fact, GDP is growing. But every kind of nonsense can be just managed and you can, if, if, if the mainstream media does this kind of propaganda. I mean, Goebbels understood uh, during Hitler's time the importance of propaganda, but, but today we are seeing it at an entirely different level altogether. So, uh, uh, it's very, very, very worrying. And that is why, I mean, one saving grace is the internet media, which is not controlled by uh, money bags and uh, where there is still a lot of uh, good journalism being done by the wire, scroll, uh, news laundry and many other, and uh, some individual people like uh, Dhruv Rati or Akash Banerjee, etc., who are doing outstanding work. And uh, another good thing is that the social media, which is a financial leveler, so to say, in the sense that uh, big money, which was earlier needed for running uh, media, is no longer required. You can start a media. Dhruv Rathi has uh, 4.25 million uh, viewers. Every video of his is watched by more than a million people. So in many ways, he competes with a number of uh, mainstream media organizations. Mm -hmm. A one-man show, so to say, mm -hmm. without mm -hmm. any money, without any funding. <clears throat> That's it. Frozen. Regulatory framework. Uh, would you like to say a few things about crony capitalism before we talk about politics and how to deal with these problems? Yeah, crony capitalism has uh, also increased uh, considerably. I mean, today. If you look, if you just look at Adani and uh, Mukesh Ambani and how their empires are not just growing, but being made to grow by a complicit government, mm -hmm. where uh, mm -hmm. agencies are being used, even the judiciary is being used. I mean, Arun Mishra, Justice Arun Mishra gave seven judgments in favor of Adani. Mm -hmm. 
benefiting them by tens of thousands of crores, at least by 30,000 crores over these seven judgments in the last one year. Some of them were authored and uh, delivered during the uh, court vacations. Uh, the uh, uh, CBI, etc., has been used against the GBK group in order to coerce them to sell the Mumbai airport to Adani. <coughs> So Adani and Ambani are being mm -hmm. helped to create monopolies in this country. We are seeing crony capitalism of a different level. First, of course, there was uh, helping Nirav Modi and Malia and uh, uh, Mehul Choksi, etc., to loot and scoot. But mm -hmm. now we are seeing something of an entirely different level, where uh, uh, every institution is being used to create monopolies of uh, <clears throat> Adani and Ambani. Uh, very, very few mm -hmm. organizations, whether it is in telecom or in electricity or in running of mm -hmm. airport. Mm -hmm. yeah. We have this crisis. We, uh, I, we are also doing some research on telecoms and we find that uh, our regulatory structure is never very, very, very powerful, but at least uh, when Mr. Shori was in power, I remember during the WLL crisis, uh, Mr. Ambani was made to pay a fine and, uh, and, 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 and actually had to pay the difference between his WLL license and the CDMA licenses that he had purchased. Uh, while there can be a lot of debate about whether that too was favorable, but at least, uh, you know, Reliance was made to concede that it had made a mistake. And under those regulatory conditions, uh, I think monopolistic propensities did not prevail. And I think a lot of uh, uh, credit has to be given to Prime Minister Vajpayee for having uh, you know, considering this challenge institution that you have just described do you think that so so great that even within the bjp or within the rss uh, there will be an undoing uh, because at the end of the day uh, there might be uh, some people who uh, want to stand above power or will this game have to be played uh, by civil society organizations and politics outside the framework or or do you think that like a lot of Congress politicians might jump over to the BJP there might be actually politicians on the other side who will now begin to think and align with the fact that the idea of India uh, is being gravely transformed how do you see the politics of transformation taking place which works with the unease that people are facing, which is very real, pal pal real and palpable. How do you visualize that transition? So uh, it doesn't seem that uh, the real uh, transformation or the fight back will come from the mainstream political parties because the mainstream mm -hmm. political parties are now uh, very heavily compromised by and large. And uh, the way the system mm -hmm. works, uh, the electoral system works, they can't function without money or they will fall by the wayside without money. And therefore, uh, even those which have a few state governments in their control are forced to use those governments to make money. The Congress is the only sort of national opposition party, but the Congress is also, mm -hmm. uh, the organization is uh, not in good shape at all. Uh, they have not paid much attention uh, to the to strengthening the organization and having proper people uh, take charge of the party organization. They need to distinguish between those who are the public face of the party. I mean, the Gandhi family, because mm -hmm. of their huge visibility advantage, and I believe that the Gandhi family is by and large decent people, except for this Robert Vardra, who has very serious problems. Uh, but uh, I find that uh, Rahul Gandhi and Sonia Gandhi and even Priyanka Gandhi to be 
decent people who say uh, who say the right things they can certainly be the public face of the party but they need to have uh, some uh, some uh, sagacious and uh, sensible people who understand the party organization mm -hmm. who run the party so they need to set up a team of mm -hmm. uh, people who understand the party who have been with the party for considerable number of years to take charge of the party organization. Mm -hmm. I feel that the real fight back has to come from the people, from people's movements, from civil society. Mm -hmm. Because, see, opposition uh, parties have chinks in their armor which can be exploited by the BJP and the ruling party. So, Mayavati can be blackmailed with disproportionate assets cases. Uh, Mulayam can be blackmailed with various other criminal cases. Most opposition parties have people who can be blackmailed. Lalu Yadav was already in jail. Uh, Robert Wadra can also be blackmailed and so on. <clears throat> but um, uh, so therefore the fight back has to come from civil society. And it is really the civil society which has to put its act together, especially the young people. Today, you see, young people, firstly, young people are the main stakeholders in the future of our society. They have their life ahead of them. They have uh, the maximum energy. They have the maximum new ideas as well. Mm -hmm. Today, uh, they are suffering the most because there are no jobs. They are uh, jobless. And uh, therefore, they need to organize themselves, stand up, and uh, fight back. Mm -hmm. There needs to be a campaign for the right to employment as a fundamental right. Mm -hmm. The Narega kind of scheme has to be expanded to every adult, so mm -hmm. that every adult is guaranteed at least 180 days of work at minimum wages. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> there needs to be a campaign on electoral reforms. There needs to be a campaign on judicial reforms and judicial accountability. There needs to be a campaign on agriculture reforms. Mm -hmm. So uh, these campaigns have to be run by civil society, which should use the social media, the internet media, etc. Also a campaign against commun uh, communalism. This is a huge danger facing us. You see, uh, the diversity of India, whether it is religious diversity, cultural diversity, uh, social diversity is a great asset, just as geographical diversity and biodiversity are assets. Similarly, cultural diversity, linguistic diversity, these are great assets for the country. And uh, there is an attempt today to destroy this diversity by saying we will create a Hindu Rashtra, etc. There is an attempt to uh, suppress uh, uh, the minorities, to suppress the Dalits and so on. We have to run campaigns against this to point out that this is going to weaken the country. This is going mm -hmm. to destroy our society. We need to build mm -hmm. upon the strengths of diversity that we have. So therefore, those campaigns can be done, especially by young people, using the social media, the internet media, etc., and physical campaigns also. Uh, so that's what we will need to do. That will, uh, that will ultimately, you see, recently we saw, we, for the last 10 days I have been seeing that the BJP, is, if you look at any social media page of the BJP, you find that the uh, uh, the uh, people are posting very nasty comments, people are uh, disliking their videos, disliking their posts and so on. Uh, in huge numbers, there are 10 times more dislikes than likes. So mm -hmm. gradually people, uh, the, the youth at least, have realized that uh, uh, these people have just taken them for a ride, this government mm -hmm. and Mr. Modi. And you mm -hmm. need to build on that. Rahul, I'll have to finish quickly. I have to go. Yes. So I think the last uh, question that I would like you to address and sincerely thank you for this very valuable uh, uh, interaction is that uh, there was an idea of India with which the constitution was born. 
<laughs> and which has persisted, of course, which which respects this diversity. And this idea of India is sought to be replaced by another idea of India. Now, do you think that our old idea of India requires a little bit of reworking in order for it to challenge the new idea of India that is being sought to be placed on the pedestal? No, the idea of India, which is enshrined in our constitution, which is to have a uh, uh, to have a democracy where everybody is equal, where everybody enjoys various civic rights uh, and various other rights, etc., where uh, uh, economic equalities are reduced, where 